Hello folks, my name's David and this is Saving Time. Now thank you for joining me at the bench here today and in front of us we see a 1950s Doxa. This one being purchased from eBay. Now eBay, like it or loathe it, I kind of fall somewhere in the middle for every bargain I seem to pick up. I also seem to get kicked in the danglies on the next one and this is just such a case. So the seller said this watch had been working but the crown had fallen off. I find that very difficult to believe. I purchased this one predominantly for the dial. You can see here, unlike the other Doxa that we took a look at, this one is actually Swiss made. Now, going around to the movement, if you're at all au fait with mechanical watch movements, you'll immediately notice something a bit suspicious here, as in half the parts of it are actually missing. So I find it very hard to believe that this was actually a runner until the crown fell off. Now, I'm going to get this watch out of its case. Obviously, we're going to need a donor movement here as well. And you'll see when this watch comes out that it still has part of the winding stem attached to it. So that will have to be remedied. But I'm going to start by removing the hands and getting the dial off. The dial being the predominant version uh, reason sorry, that I bought this watch. Now, the dial on this watch is lovely. Uh, so the hands are coming off. I prefer to use hand levers uh, here just to pop the hands off and a piece of paper there just to protect against any scratches on the dial. Now, this watch, as I said, was an eBay purchase, and I've always had mixed bag of luck when it comes to eBay. So in this business, you buy the seller, not the watch, especially if you're buying more expensive stuff. You really want to get a seller with a good reputation. Now, this watch wasn't that expensive due to the fact that it was a non-runner, but I still overpaid considering I only got half uh, movement. So I'm going to introduce a donor watch here, which I also purchased, which looks even worse condition than this one, but it actually had a surprisingly good movement in it. Now, the movement in this was mostly complete. It did tick a little bit. It keeps time about as well as a sundial in the dark, however. So let's get it into a movement holder. Now, this is the movement from the donor watch. This is a Swiss ETA 1147. And I'm going to start by unscrewing the balance cock here and removing the balance complete. Uh, the reason I do this is because the spring you can see there uh, going in and out, oscillating, is an incredibly fragile part. And I don't want to knock that uh, during the disassembly process. Now, I've had this on a time grapher, which is an instrument to measure how accurate a mechanical watch is, amongst other things. And this is basically just snow. This, this watch does not keep time at all. And I'm actually going to end up here using parts from both of these watches in order to make one functional watch. Now, they are both at her 1147 caliber movements. So they're both the same movement in both the watch I bought for the dial and the watch I bought as a donor. So the parts are interchangeable. Now, you can see here that's come off. The hairspring looks intact, which is nice. And before I continue anything on the disassembly, I am going to wind all the power out the watch, which I do by moving the click, uh, which is connected to the ratchet wheel and then letting the power slowly come out of the watch. So that's the ratchet wheel there. That's the crown wheel and that's the click. These all sit on top of the barrel bridge, the barrel being underneath containing the spring for the main power source of the watch. So I'm going to disassemble those three components now, and that will allow me to then remove the train bridge, then the barrel bridge and then the barrel. And that will disassemble most of the uh, <clears throat> of the back side of the watch. So for those of you that don't know, ETA is a, a Bush a movement manufacturer, meaning they create movements for other watch houses. Now, unlike the previous docs that I looked at, which I'll link up in the corner there somewhere, this one is actually Swiss. So ETA or ETA are a Swiss movement manufacturer. You'll find them in tons of high end watches. This particular movement has been heavily modified by Doxa. So this watch, in my opinion, is actually worth saving. This is a very nice 1950s uh, example from Doxa here. Again, unlike the previous Doxa we looked at, which was more French than it was Swiss. Interesting video, that one, though, so I will link it. Now, that's got all of the components off the top of the barrel bridge here. The click is coming out. There's a spring under this that you want to be careful with because it will shoot into the stratosphere. And we are disassembled there. You can see that spring. Now, I bring in a bit of pith wood here to clean my tweezers by plunging them into the wood. This is incredibly soft wood. 
and it will just remove any oily residue that we've picked up. So trainer wheels bridge is coming off here. This one's got a cap jewel on the top, which is rather nice. Um, in fact, this watch in, in completeness is rather nicely made, this movement. Etta, um, there you can see a close-up of the cap jewel. Etta being a very, very nice movement manufacturer. In fact, there's an Etta movement in the Hamilton wristwatch uh, that I'm wearing at the moment. So the bridge is coming off. Now this can be a little fiddly. There's normally a place to put your screwdriver uh, so you can wedge the bridge up. You want to be a bit careful not to bend the pivots on the wheels. And I'm going to remove the cap jewel here as well. Now these screws on these cap jewels are absolutely microscopic. So I'm taking a bit of time here. And the cap jewel should just come right out. And this just makes that a little bit easier for cleaning, oiling and replacement if necessary. So this is the center seconds wheel. The second hand is directly connected to that wheel, which is why it has such a long pivot on it, because it has to go all the way through the center of the watch. For the second hand, intermediate wheel comes out, and this will allow me to then take off the barrel bridge. So the barrel bridge is sitting on top of the barrel complete, the barrel uh, holding the mainspring for the watch, which is what provides the watch with its power source here. So the first screw comes out. It's a little bit stuck there, but it does come out. Now I'm going to undo the setting lever screw here, which will allow the setting lever to drop off the bottom side of the watch or the dial side of the watch. So I'll show you the setting lever. Now that's actually connected to the dial side, but it's connected via that screw. So it will fall off in some cases when you undo that screw. Something to watch out for. The last screw comes out the barrel bridge, and this will allow me to remove that barrel completely, uh, the barrel bridge completely, and then remove the barrel underneath it. So uh, there is a little slot for your screwdriver on either side, so you can get under there and lever it out. You want to be a bit careful with that, not to damage anything that's hanging on underneath, as I've said before. And in this case, the barrel complete is actually stuck to the barrel bridge. No, it's not too, struck, too stuck. I can just lift it off. But that's probably just old oil gumming it up on the top there. So there's the barrel complete. And finally, the barrel bridge itself comes out. Just make sure there's nothing else stuck to the underside of it. Now I can also take out the sliding pinion and the winding pinion here. This is actually part of the keyless works, which allows you to wind and set the watch without a key. Uh, very convenient, because back in the day you would have needed to carry a separate key to wind your pocket watch. Now that's the thinnest sliding pinion I've seen. Nothing wrong with that, the winding pinion, sorry. Uh, just a note though, it is a little thinner than I'm used to seeing. Now I can take off the pallet bridge, the pallet cock, and remove the pallet fork underneath it. Now, again, when you're levering this up, you want to be careful not to bend the pivots of anything it's connected to. And you'll see this one is also a bit gummed up because the pallet fork is stuck underneath it. So I'm going to have to just remove that carefully. There you go. Uh, well, I said carefully, but I ended up dropping it. But there you see the pallet fork and the pallet bridge. So I'll be able to take out the little bridge here that holds down our center wheel. That's the wheel in the very center of the watch. So this one also has those microscopic screws. It also has its own cap jaw here for ease of cleaning uh, and whatnot. So let's get that out. The center wheel itself won't actually come out of the watch at this point because it's connected via the dial side of the watch via the cannon pinion. And you'll see me remove that with a special tool in a moment. So there's that bridge out, just making sure nothing's stuck underneath it. Our escape wheel has been yeeted across the watch, so we'll get that one out now as well. And that pretty much concludes the disassembly of this side of the watch. So just take out the setting lever screw there, the thing that the setting lever was connected to. So this brings us to the dial side of the watch. Now this is normally where, or always pretty much, where the keyless and motion works live. Also calendar works, if you have any of those in your watch, would normally live on this side also. So I'm going to take out this little bridge here, which is holding down our minute wheel and intermediate setting wheel. Now, I don't know if I mentioned, but part of the reason I show this screws to the camera is more for me than it is for the you, the viewer. As when I come to reassemble this thing, I often refer back to these videos as to which screw goes where. Although, to be fair, a watch movement, if you know what you're looking at, will kind of tell you which screw goes where by the shape of the holes, the size of the holes, whether they're flat bottomed or V-grooved. Uh, so you can normally get a good idea even if you don't have the video. 
Now, again, I checked the bottom of the bridge. In this case, I just wanted to see what condition it was in. And here you can see my Canon pinion remover, which just allows me to remove that press fit Canon pinion. And you'll notice the center seconds wheel there, sorry, the center wheel in this case, not the seconds wheel, has dropped off the bottom of the watch. So there you can see that wheel. So that's the reason we left it on the other side. It's actually press fit. So the intermediate setting wheel comes out here. Now this wheel is a bridge between the keyless and motion works. Uh, what allows you to wind and set the watch basically. Our minute wheel comes out here. And now I can turn my attention to this cover plate that's holding in our keyless works. So this cover plate actually holds down the yoke and the yoke spring, but it also has the setting jumper at the end of it, which allows us to turn the setting from winding to setting. So basically in one position, it will wind the main spring of the watch. And in the second position, it will actually set the time on the watch. So I'm going to take out the yoke spring. Now this little spring will fly across the room on you. So I'm holding it down with a bit of pegwood. You can also use a little bit of plastic over the top of it to stop it going too far. But in this case, a bit of pegwood was all that was required. Now the yoke comes out. And I think all that's really uh, required now is to remove those two cap jewels you can see here and here. So again, the screws on these are fairly microscopic, uh, but they do allow for easier servicing of the watch, if you like. They increase the longevity of the watch. They're easy to oil and easy to replace. So if I haven't mentioned it before, I think I probably have this Eta movement was very, very nice to work on. It's a very nice movement. And there you can see our capsules. So here is the dial side of the watch completely stripped bare, nothing left on it. And here is the back side of the watch completely stripped bare. So now it's time to clean the watch. So I'll leave you with a cleaning montage here. So now all of our component parts have been put into their respective holders. I'm going to chuck it all in a box standard ultrasonic cleaner. Now I use Elma Pro uh, waterless rinsing and cleaning agents, which I would highly recommend. They do a fantastic job and they don't melt the shellac. So our watch is back from the cleaners looking very nice. Now these red boxes I use to hold watch compartments. I actually designed and 3D printed. The commercial ones are a little large. I also designed mine to be stackable or a little large for me. I designed mine to be stackable because I often work on more than one thing. And I designed them to very easily come apart because you don't want to have to yank them apart. The world's worst magic trick, basically, as you watch all of your parts go shooting across the room. So I'll include a link down below, a link to the printing files. If you want to print the same boxes I designed here, be my guest. Now, this is the mainspring of the watch, which needs to go back in the barrel. I did disassemble the barrel complete for cleaning. I didn't get it on camera, unfortunately, but there is the component parts of it. Now, I'm going to use an antique watch winder from the 1960s, I believe, to wind the spring back up into shape so it can be put back into the barrel and oiled. So you'll see me here winding that spring in. This is the tool that allows me to do it. Now, these come in various different sizes. The tools, um, depending on the size of the spring and the size of the barrel, it can get quite complicated to find the right winder for the job. In this case, it's a pretty standard spring, so it goes back in nice and easy. Now, you have to be careful of the hook on the back to make sure you hook that in there. Give it a final half twist. I'm going to use a pair of tweezers here when I pull out the uh, the top of the tool just to make sure I don't pull that spring out because there's a lot of power currently stored in that spring and you don't want that going away from you. But you can see it's there in the winder. Um, easy enough job this one. And I'm going to use a little bit of oil to oil the bottom of the barrel. I'll also oil the spring. Now it's worth noting this is probably not the best oil for the job. This is Mobius HP 1300. 
Uh, I probably would have been better off with something from the Mobius 8000 series, uh, a synthetic or even uh, a non-synthetic grease. Uh, this Mobius HP 1300 is quite a heavy duty oil, but it's probably not the best choice for this application. Uh, I don't know why I used it. I just, I watched the video back and it was a case of, ah, that probably wasn't the right tool for the job. But anyway, I'm going to push the spring back in and then give that a little bit of oil as well. Now, the HP 1300, again, I'm going to say it, just uh, do as I, um, don't do as I do. Uh, this is probably not the best for this application. It does, however, work. So uh, it is what it is. I just noticed it on, on uh, watching the video back. So obviously having a bit of a senior moment there. So with that watch oiled, that oil will actually sink into the spring and distribute itself as the spring is wound and unwound in the watch. I'm going to put the cap back on the barrel here. Now there's a little plastic tool you can use to get this on. I cannot find mine. So I'm going to use the back of a, pair, a couple of pair of tweezers and just push that gently into place like so. So this brings us to the back side of the watch where the wheel train escapement live uh, and all that good stuff. And I'm going to start the reassembly by oiling the, the little bit here that our center wheel will sit on. So this is the right oil for the job. HP 1300s are hardware and oil, and this wheel will get a lot of use. So that's going to flip back in here. And again, I've said this on videos before, but I won't show every single step of the oiling. I'll try and get a lot of it, uh, but some of it's really, really tiny, and I need higher magnification. So a bit of oil for the top of our center wheel. Also, before I put the center wheel bridge back on, before I put the bridges back on, I'll want to oil their cap jewels. So here I'm going to come in with a little bit of oil for the cap jewel. Now, this was quite difficult to film, but I think you can see just get a little bit of dot in the center or dot of oil in the center of the cap jewel and the cap jewel goes back in the bridge. Now, one of the reasons I like to get these jewels back on their bridges before I put the watch back together is this wouldn't be the first time I've put a center wheel bridge on, got the rest of the watch together, only to discover that I've forgotten to put the cap jewel on and have to take everything apart. So I'm using a bit of pegwood to hold that steady while I screw down that incredibly tiny screw there. I'll also give the watch a little bit of polish with some Radico here. Now, even though it's been through the cleaner, occasionally you'll get some specks of dust uh, just happens. So I like to double check and make sure everything is as clean as can be. Now we'll also have to repeat this procedure for the center wheel bridge here. So I'm just going to put the cap jewel back on. And for those of you wondering when I say small screws, just exactly what that means, I'll kind of demonstrate it to you now by holding one. So here you can see the tiny, tiny screw in the palm of my hand. So if it looks slightly shaky on camera, I think you might see why now. But we're just going to screw this one back in. Now, this one didn't need oiling because it's simply a hole that the jewel goes through and we've already oiled the top of our center wheel. So that should do the trick here for this particular jewel. Now that's built together. I can start putting these bridges back on the watch. So the center wheel one goes back in. Now these bridges can be a little fiddly to get in. This one is not too bad because that pivot hole in the center wheel is ginormous. Well, ginormous in watchmaking terms. I'm just going to make sure after that bridge is in that our wheel spins freely. And this is just good practice. I like to do this whenever I put something in that covers the pivot of a wheel. So in go those, uh, again, microscopic screws, which you saw the demonstration of those in my hand. These are extremely easy to lose and extremely fiddly to get back in. However, this one goes back in without too many issues. It's the trainer wheel bridge that's normally quite tricky because you've got a lot of pivots that have to be in exact kind of positions. But quite happy with the way this watch is going back together so far. I mean, I know we've only just started, but this one has been quite the pleasure to work on. And now with the bridge in place, we can go ahead and put our intermediate wheel back in. And that will then allow us to drop our center seconds wheel back in as well. Now, if you remember, the center seconds wheel is the one with the incredibly long pivot. Uh, because the second hand would be connected to it via the other side of the watch. So there you can see that incredibly long uh, pivot point or stem of the center second wheel there going in place. And again, I'll probably move these wheels around just to make sure everything is interfacing okay. They're a little bit wobbly without their bridge. 
So the barrel complete goes in, that's the part where we wound the main spring back into with our antique watch winders and once again we'll just have a little trundle around on those wheels partly to check and partly because I like looking at it. Right, so in goes the escape wheel. Now this one will be very tricky to fit and very tricky to fit under the bridge. So the escape wheel, as you can see, lives right at the bottom there. It's kind of not at the bottom of the watch. That pivot on the other side is longer, but you can see where it goes. Now, before I put the bridges back on, I like to put the setting lever screw in. Uh, this is because on a lot of watches, this won't fit through the barrel bridge. So if you put the barrel bridge on and forget this bit, you'll then be in a world of trouble and have to disassemble the watch. So I'm using Mobius HP 1300 here again. Um, it could have been the 8000 series Mobius Grease. In this case, I don't think it makes that much of a difference. Perhaps some more, uh, some more experienced watchmaker than me will like to comment and let me know, but I've used Mobius HP 1300 for that, and I think it does the job. So the barrel bridge goes on. I'm not going to screw this down just yet. The reason I'm putting this on is to keep the barrel in place so when I test the train of wheels, uh, the barrel's not wobbling about. So a bit of radico again, just to get rid of any surface dust or maybe surface smudges that I can, the best job that I can do. And the train of wheel bridge goes on now. Now I'm going to edit this in such a way that this goes on pretty quickly. In this particular watch, for whatever reason, this train of wheels bridge was very difficult to fit right. Uh, it would often jam up. The pivot point for the escape wheel was very, very difficult to get in place. You can see the other two wheels as I push down. You can see the pivots pop through there. They're no problem. However, the escape wheel was. So I took a moment and got that on. And as you can see, the wheels are now running freely. It's incredibly important to check that. If you tighten this bridge down while one of the pivots is out of place, you'll end up bending a pivot and you're going to need some very specialist equipment to unbend that equipment at this point in time. I personally don't have access to. So the bridge is being screwed down off camera. I have been checking at every step in the way to make sure we have these wheels running free. You can see here I check again and everything is free. Nothing is binding. You can see the pivots uh, of the center wheel and the intermediate wheel coming through the top of the bridge there. So now that's done, I can get the barrel bridge screwed back down and we can start to rebuild the barrel. Now there's only two screws on this barrel bridge, which is fairly common. Sometimes you'll see a third one. Uh, this one is using just the two, so it's quite nice and easy to fit back together again. Now what I like to do before I go any further is put the pallet fork and pallet bridge back in. This will stop the train of wheels moving freely. Uh, and the reason you don't want that is at this point, it's possible to put some power into the watch and have those wheels spin at a thousand miles an hour. So I'm just doing a little drop of oil on our exit pallet here before I put that back in. I'm also using the pith wood that I use to clean my tweezers with to just push in the pivot, both top and bottom of the pallet fork. This will help clean any residual uh, gunk off it. Now there shouldn't be any but again, you can't be too careful with these components. So the pallet fork went back in, and even though I film on three cameras, I managed to somehow get my hand in front of all three, but I give you a close-up shot there of where the pallet fork actually lives, and now the pallet bridge goes back on top of it. And again, this is one of those things where you have to make sure the pivot is actually coming through the jaw before you tighten it down. Now, I had some issues with this. I haven't got the pivot through the jewel here, I'll be honest. And I'm going to tighten this down and it kind of looks like it's through, but I'm watching the footage back and I have a problem later on with this watch. I can tell you right now that that pivot is not properly adjusted. I will come back and fix it. Uh, and as you can see, it is sort of doing its job. I couldn't freely rotate the train of wheels. So uh, a little mistake on my part there. So I'm doing some oil now for the crown wheel. I'm going to oil the bottom a little bit because the crown wheel rests on there. You can actually see where some of the metal plating is worn off. Uh, I'm going to put the center of the crown wheel back, the crown wheel being in two pieces, and I'm going to oil the outside of the crown wheel before I put that back. And this will allow us to build up the section of the watch that 
lives on top of the train bridge. So there's the crown wheel going back on. There we go. And again, I'll probably check to make sure that's rotating freely. It's not binding with anything. So the crown wheel screw goes back on. Now, most of the time, these will be reverse threaded uh, to stop them unwinding, um, to stop them unscrewing themselves. But that one goes back on nice and easy here. So I'll move over now to the ratchet wheel. Again, a little bit of Rudico. I'm trying to keep this one as clean as possible. Um, this macro vision lens shows absolutely everything. So if you see a little speck of dust or tiny, tiny hair somewhere, it's probably not visible by the naked eye, which is why I always like to come in and do a bit of cleaning with a Rudico. So I'm going to do a little bit of oil for the ratchet wheel here, which will sit on top of the barrel. Okay, there we go. Uh, I've actually already added a little bit of oil to the barrel arbor as well, which was off camera. But you'll see this wheel is a little bit tricky to get in because the top of it's square. So don't lose your patience with this one and give it a swack. I have done it in the past, I will admit. Um, and again, getting a little bit of schmutz off there, making sure everything is nice and in order before I tighten down that screw. A ginormous screw on the ratchet wheel here or a change um, and there we go so you can see i can sort of wind the watch now but as soon as i release tension off it it springs back that's because we do not have a click on this watch which is part of the ratcheting mechanism which will allow the watch to store power so until that is on these wheels will just freely rotate forwards which will wind the spring and then they'll immediately want to snap backwards so we need to get our crown on and our uh sorry not our crown we need to get our click on and our click spring so the click spring goes on first and the click just sits on top of that now it's called the click for those of you that don't know because when you wind a mechanical watch you'll hear a click 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 sound it's this ratcheting mechanism that makes that sound so the other th sound you might hear from a mechanical watch if you put it for its ear is it's fast tick 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 this is the pallets from the pallet fork striking the escape wheel. So now that ratchet wheel is turning, but when it snaps back, the click snaps into place and stops the spring from losing its power in the barrel. And there's a close up there of the click spring itself. So that's what returns the mechanism back to true to lock the crown wheel, to lock the ratchet wheel in place. And I should be able to nip the pallet fork backwards and forwards, and it should just dive backwards and forwards really easily. I shouldn't have to push it the whole way across. Now, I'm going to fess up here and say I did have to readjust that. As I previously mentioned, it wasn't sitting right in its pivot. So off camera, I readjusted that. I've checked it. It is now sitting correctly. So apart from the balance, we are done with the back side of the watch. And we're going to flip over to the dial side and put together the keyless and motion works. Starting out here with a little bit of oil for our center wheel pivot. The cannon pinion will be press fit to this. It will just clip on the top. So a little bit of oil there to allow that cannon pinion to spin as freely as possible when it needs to. And this will be a press fit. So I'm just going to use a pair of brass tweezers here to get that into place and then clamp it down. So with that done, we can turn our attention here to oiling the cap jewels, which live on this side of the watch, on the dial side of the watch. So just a little bit of oil for each one here. Now I'm using a lighter Mobius oil for these, not the heavy HP 1300. And those are going on and they should just pop back right in their respective places. So again, these are using the tiny screws. Uh, not too difficult on these ones, however. As I say, Eto make a good movement. Um, I, I would thoroughly recommend if you're on the lookout for a Swiss watch, sort of sub couple of thousand dollars, you'll probably end up with an Eto movement and there's nothing wrong with that. They make very, very nice stuff. So little screws going back in for the top of these cap jewels here. Uh, there is really no reason to fit these at this early stage, but there's no reason not to either. Again, it just depends in which order you want to do this on. And for me, uh, I often forget these. Don't know why, senior moment perhaps, but they can be very easy to overlook. You can sort of finish the watch, look in your watch tray and go, oh, yeah, uh, probably should have fit those. So that's why I like to get them out of the way at this stage. So again, a little bit of Radico just to make sure we don't have any residual anything on those. 
And now a little bit of oil for our minute wheel here. Uh, so the minute wheel will live on top of this. I'm going to use a little bit of oil on the bottom as well. You can see the wear pattern there where the minute wheel has been turning around there where it's rubbed off the plating. You can see the brass coming through. So that minute wheel goes in. Now it's funny to note that this watch has the Roman numeral for eight on it, V-I-I-I, -I -I, and that's prevalent on the dial side of the watch. It's also prevalent on the balance. Uh, so I don't know whether that was technician number eight that previously serviced this. Uh, just kind of an interesting piece of history. This watch has definitely been opened and serviced in the past. So our intermediate wheel going in there, that would be the bridge between the keyless and motion works. And I'm going to use a little bit of grease now on this um, sliding pinion. So just everywhere there's very heavy metal and metal contact, I like to use a Mobius 8000 series grease. Um, there are various different 8000s in the Mobius series, but I think I'm using 8400 here. I'm not entirely sure. But anyway, a little bit of grease for the back of the watch where our winding pinion will interface with it. Now, I'm not going to grease the teeth on the winding pinion because uh, they'll interface with the teeth on the sliding pinion and the sliding pinion grease will hopefully transfer over and get both. So a two for one, if you like. But you can see that sliding pinion going backwards and forwards interfacing with the winding pinion. And now I can put the yoke on. So I'm going to use again a little bit of heavy duty grease on the bottom of the yoke because that will actually slide across the bottom of the watch. And again, if you look, you can actually see where the plating has moved off or uh, been rubbed off from the action of that yoke sliding backwards and forwards. So I've also uh, oiled the, the staff that the yoke sits on as well, or greased in this case. And you can see there are sliding pinions slide backwards and forwards with the yoke sitting in that indentation. Uh, that's what it does. It engages the sliding pinion either into the winding part or the setting part. Now, the horrible uh, yoke spring is going in, so I'm going to use a plastic bag just in case this thing tries to launch itself. Now, it's a little difficult to work with the plastic bag sitting on top of each uh, everything. It's a little bit inconvenient, but it's a lot more convenient than trying to find your spring that will undoubtedly ping off and orbit Neptune at some point in the process. So if you're a beginner like me, if you're just starting out in this, I would highly recommend the plastic bag trick. I'm, I can't remember where I picked it up, but I've been using it for quite some time uh, and it's saved my bacon on a number of occasions. So that spring is in. That actually took me a bit longer than it looks like it did. That can be a bit of a pig. Um, it's definitely not the easiest part to fit in. So I'm going to put the cover plate back on top as soon as possible because that spring is under a lot of tension and I have left it uh, for a time to go and make a cup of tea before and come back and it's not been there. So the cover plate is holding the yoke and the yoke spring down. The cover plate also has its own sort of spring, uh, which is used as a setting jumper again to set between winding the watch and setting the time. But that cover plate goes in nice and easy. Uh, I'm going to put a little bit of uh, grease on the setting jumper here, because that will make metal again, metal on metal contact that will be interfacing with the setting lever. Uh, so anywhere there's heavy metal and metal contact, I like to use the Mobius grease. So the cover plate for the minute wheel and the intermediate wheel, this will stop those falling out when you turn the watch over, which would be rather unfortunate. Uh, and again, this, this plate's not too difficult to fit. It just needs two screws. And once this has been fit to the watch, we'll be able to test the keyless works to make sure we can wind and set the watch. So the first screw goes in with very little issues, as you would expect. The second screw goes in and then I'll move on to testing the keyless works. We'll check that the setting jumper actually jumps across. We'll check that we can both wind and set the watch. So here is the keyless works. You can see the setting jumper there jumping backwards and forwards between setting mode and winding mode. So that all works. Now I had to find a different stem for this watch, but there is the watch winding. Um, I will test the watch setting. There you go. You can see those wheels in the center moving about would be moving the hands if they were on the watch to actually set the time. So just for illustrative purposes, I'm going to put the hour wheel back on. And the reason I say for illustrative purposes is I'm going to have to turn it, take it off again when I flip the watch. But I just wanted to see uh, for you guys to see where that was actually going. So that consists of the hour wheel, 
and also the dial washer, which acts as a spacer between the dial and the top of the watch. Now I need to take care of oiling the jewels on this side of the watch. We can flip the watch over and put the balance cock and balance complete in. Now talking of that, I have disassembled these and oiled them off camera. Uh, I tried to get that on camera, but unfortunately I managed to get a terrible view. But just so you can see that that was actually disassembled, cleaned, which needs to be done because there's no ink block set in. And we're going to throw it back in the watch. Now, hopefully we are going to see that tick. I need to oil those two jewels there before we do this, however. And a little bit of oil goes in there. Now, that might have been a bit too much oil. It's quite a tricky to do this on camera because I'm not using the correct magnification. But... I think it should just be about right, maybe a little bit too much oil. So our balance goes in here, our balance cock mounted on its plate, and hopefully we're going to see this watch tick, which we do. Now that's always the moment of truth for me. You never quite know if you've got the thing back together properly until that goes on. But you can see that spins with what looks by eye to be very good amplitude. Uh, so I'm just going to let this tick for a bit, get that screw screwed in, uh, the balance cock screw there. And that should be the last major thing that needs to be done to this. Now, it will need to be put back together. Uh, the winding stem I found for this watch being an Etta movement, it wasn't difficult to find, but it is too long. So I'm going to need to cut down the winding stem. But here's some shots of the watch just happily ticking away. So it looks quite nice. The amplitude by eye looks good to me. Uh, just by eye, I've seen quite a lot of these things tick, and this one seems to be beating uh, fairly normally. Now, obviously, we'll need to get it on a time grapher to test it, and I'll need to get this watch back in its case so I can cut this winding stem down to size, because sticking out like this, obviously, that's no good. The first time you bump your watch into anything, uh, the crown would just ping straight off. So I'm going to mark this with a black marker and I'm just going to use a pair of cutters to cut it. Uh, the top of the, um, the winding stem is always threaded, which allows the crown to be screwed to it. So unscrew the crown, cut the stem, screw the crown back on. And there you can see it now fits the watch. So all that remains to be done is basically the cosmetics of this watch. The dial needs to go on. The hands need to go on. Uh, well, I say cosmetics, obviously, without them, you wouldn't be able to tell the time. So fairly, fairly essential parts of the watch. Uh, but as to um, having to do anything more mechanical on this, we shouldn't have to, depending on the results from the time grapher. So that dial seats on. Again, the reason I bought the watch, I love that dial. Uh, I'm going to use the uh, dial foot screws here. I'm going to tighten them up so the dial can't flap about in the breeze. Being especially careful not to, to touch that hairspring and balance there while it's in motion. So there's two screws normally for dial feet. There's a little feet that fit into the movement and then the screws clamp them together. Now I had two hands for this watch, hour and minute. I did not have a second hand, so I have found another second hand. I'm going to give these hands a little bit of a polish. I'm not going to go too mad. The dial does have a very aged patina to it an ultra shiny brand new looking hands would look weird in my opinion also worth noting that these hands are supposed to carry luminous paint down the middle of them now i'm not going to do that in this particular build i kind of like the skeleton eyes look um although this is sort of me from the future voicing over this video and after living with this watch for a week i can tell you that i will go back and put the loom on because the skeletonized hands make the time very difficult to read I also, if you're a viewer of my channel, you know I recently did a doxa from the 1940s, late 1940s, that I didn't have hands for. So I need to hand blue the hands for that watch, and I need to add loom to the hands for this watch. So if anyone's interested, interested I might do an episode on just hands, where I loom these ones and blue the zenith ones. But anyway, they do look rather nice. They just make it quite difficult to tell the time, especially in lower light conditions. Um, not that this watch is ever going to be a tall watch. You know, I'm never going to be wearing this watch while I'm uh, in the garage building something, working on the car or whatever. Uh, this is definitely a dress piece for me, an occasional piece. So I got the hands back on there. And I'm going to fit the second hand. And the reason I put the bezel on right now, or just lay the bezel on, is I think that the second hand might be a little bit too long. 
Uh, I just want to make sure that it doesn't come into contact with that bezel at any point. Now it ends up doing that, um, so I cut it down a little bit, just a millimeter or two. Okay, so I've got the watch back in its case, uh, which is just this watch drops in from the front, so it's very easy. And I lay that bezel back on. I really want to make sure that second hand is not coming into contact with anything. I also want to use the crown and winding stem here to make sure that the hands don't bump into each other at any point. It's not uncommon when you put hands back on a watch that at some point in the process they'll bump into each other and that will stop the watch from running. So I want to make sure that after I go a complete revolution around as well and bring the minute hand back up to 12 that the minute and hour hand are perfectly in alignment. Now with that being good I can actually press fit the crystal into the bezel ring. Now I use a very cheap press for this. I designed a 3D printed part that's slightly bigger than my crystal here. So when I push down on that, the crystal will contract slightly, allowing me to move the bezel ring up and press fit them together. So that's as easy as that. Now there are fancier presses for this, but you know, being a hobbyist, you are quite forced to make your own sometimes. Now I need to press fit the bezel onto the watch and the back, and here it is. So I'm going to go ahead and press fit that and then throw this on a time grapher for you guys. So the time graphing results has been on here for a while now are not bad. It's about minus six seconds a day. I have changed the position a bit. The beat error at 1.3 is a little large. You want that beat un error under one millisecond normally. Um, the amplitude is good. You know, for a vintage watch, the amplitude is actually very good. Uh, that beat error doesn't concern me that much. It is a bit large, but on a watch this old, it could be adjusted out, but there's a risk to that adjustment. It's not the easiest adjustment to do. It's very easy to break things um, at that point. The traces are not the cleanest, but all in all, I am super pleased with the way this thing came back together, especially as it's an, amalgama an, an amalgamation of two watches. And just so you all know we're on the level here, there is the actual Doxa on the time graphing stand. So I'll give you a couple of shots of what this thing looks like on wrist. To me, it looks superb. I am very happy with this. I bought this watch specifically for the dial, really loved it. Uh, the case is a bit of a trash nugget, I'm not gonna lie. I did a full case restoration on my Zenith. Um, so I'll link that video up in the top corner if you wanna see a full case restoration on this. Or if you want to see me do a full case restoration, should I say, I might do a full case restoration on this particular watch. I like it enough to do that. If you want to see that, do give me a comment down below. Uh, if you've watched me up until this point, a subscription to the channel would be superb. Thank you very much. Give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down, depending on how you felt. And anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this one. It sure has been nice talking to you folks. And I'll see you in the next one. Cheers. Cheers.